Keeping you informed, Mark Brené on CFAX 1070. Let me tell you about the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees and the moon up above and a thing called us. 435, 25 minutes before 5. Have you had that talk with your kid yet? No, not that talk. The talk about money. Today is Financial Literacy Day. And the thinking is the earlier children get to handle money, get to understand the value of money, the better off they'll be dealing with money when it comes to getting a credit card, buying a car, and if they're really, really lucky, owning a home. Today is 2CAM Day. 2CAM is an acronym. It stands for Talk With Our Kids About Money. Gary Rabior is president of the Canadian Foundation for Economic Education, which is a nonprofit that set up this program about seven years ago. Good afternoon, Gary. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being there. So who's talking money today? Well, all across the country, you're right, we're in our seventh year of the program, and uh, across the country we've had about just over 8,000 teachers registered to start talks with their kids about money or continue those talks. We also have thousands of parents uh, talking with their kids about money, too, and there have been activities going on in uh, various centers across the country. Uh, B.C. has proclaimed it Financial Literacy Day. Uh, we have towns and cities that have done similarly, and so uh, we're just encouraging everybody to take this day. Any day can be a talk with their kids about money day, but if, if you haven't thought about it yet or you haven't been inclined to do so yet, today would be a good day to start. And um, we have a website, talkwithourkidsaboutmoney.com, uh, and with our partner Scotiabank supporting it. It is all free and in English and in French for anybody who would like to get started and need some help. And there's resources for teachers and for parents for kids of all ages. So what age should children and parents be talking about money? We encourage it at a very young age, and the resources on the home program on the website start at age five. You can start it even earlier if you like. But the the thing we try to encourage among parents is that rather than trying to stuff knowledge into young heads, really the focus should be on how they act, how they behave, how they make their decisions, and create certain behaviors in terms of their, what they do and how they behave with money. Because if you do that at a young age, when those behaviors are being developed, it's much easier than doing behavior modification when they're teenagers and those behaviors have already been set and you're trying to steer them in different ways. So if they're good behaviors that we can build into our kids and they'll help them in their futures, it's so much easier and better to start young than it is to try and correct them later on if, when they're older. So what kind of things should they discuss, like specifically? Well, I think uh, one of the most important things that we think and that you can often do with a, a very young child is to have them appreciate that whenever they make a decision with something going to do with their money, they're making a trade-off. They're giving up something else either today or in the future that they could get. And they start to appreciate, at least with each decision, considering their options and possibilities, and at the same time start to recognize perhaps some of the benefits of overcoming instant gratification that, geez, if you think about it and look ahead, and if you save your money, then you could get this down the road, then as soon as they start to make those trade-offs, hopefully they start to make some better decisions too. And one of the other things parents can do with their kids starting at a very young age is help them set a goal. And that can be with an allowance at an age of five or six that is something they want to save for, help work with them to save and achieve that goal, and see what it feels like when you actually set a goal in mind work to achieve it, actually achieve it. And if we can instill that kind of sense in young people, later on they will set goals, they will plan, they will make trade-offs because they've felt what it's like to take control of their lives that way. Yeah, I was going to ask you what age you feel feel that uh, a child should be given an allowance for doing chores around the house, but you mentioned about five, is that what you said? I think whenever, uh, and uh, an allowance is a very personal thing for parents to do with their kids because attitudes towards money and teaching about money is different from household to household, but we feel the younger you can start a child to have some responsibility in making financial decisions that you can work with them to do so, uh, the better, because not only that at a young age, if they make a mistake, and in some cases it's not bad to let them make a mistake because mistakes teach lessons very well, and if they really want something on Friday 
and you don't think it's a good buy, but you let them do it and they don't care a hoot about it next Tuesday, um, then they see what it's like to maybe make a mistake with their money and learn from that mistake to maybe think more carefully next time they make it, rather than later on when they're looking to buy a car or something like that, and the consequence of making a wrong mistake has much greater consequence in their life. And how, much, how important is it for them to actually handle money, like physically have it in their hands, go to the store, get the change, um, and, and realize, oh, gosh, that was more expensive. You know, I didn't know there was tax on this, that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, it's really important for the young people to start to understand why things differ in value, too. And making purchases of different degrees lets them start to develop that that understanding. But at the same time, money, uh, you know, some people argue we should live in a cash society rather than a cashless society because you spend a lot more carefully often when you have a wad of cash in your pocket than you do when you have a credit card or a debit card that you never actually see or feel the cash move. So uh, starting with cash, it can really help them appreciate their financial decisions, help them appreciate the limits limitations that there are in money and you've only got this amount that you can spend and maybe move later on into more the concept of the cards and debit cards and things like that where they don't actually have a chance to feel and touch and know the quantity of money. So you're right, at a young age, that often is a good way to start. It puts them a little bit more in the sense of, hey, you can't have everything you want. Money is uh, a limited thing. You've got to make decisions about it. And starting with some cash is a good way to start that lesson. I know this is subjective to parents who are listening, and it's their business and their children, so they, you know it's up to them. Uh, but, but at what age do you figure it's, it's okay to sign off on your child's first credit card? Uh, you're quite right. That's a very personal decision. I mean, the, the reality is is that like everything else, when they hit a certain age, they'll be inundated with those. They'll be offered to it. Uh, and so that was something they'll hit later on. Often at a younger age, it can be good for a parent to actually provide their child and 14, 15, maybe a little younger, with access to a credit card that they monitor, that they keep in control, that they help them learn how to manage it effectively. It can also help, interestingly, to build a credit record. Um, if you give your child something like a credit card, work with them closely, then teach them how to handle it, they will build up a record of having taken on debt, paid it back, paid it back on time, and later on, if they do it and use it wisely, that actually is a plus on that credit side later on, because often many young people look to first borrow money with no credit rating whatsoever. And instead, if you can kill two birds with one stone, help them learn how to manage a credit card effectively, and at the same time build up a positive credit record, both of those things can help your child later on. Gary, the B.C. government recently put in a new curriculum that includes financial literacy, and as mentioned, this is Financial Literacy Day here in British Columbia. How do you see the curriculum working? Is it, is it doing, is it, is it, is it, has it been successful? Yeah, well, I know that BC has uh, put a, uh, financial literacy explicitly into all of their mathematics courses, which is a nice, and it's infusing it into some other courses that they go through their curriculum development process. And I think uh, similarly to other provinces across the country, there's a recognition um, that as much as what there's a mathematical aspect of financial education, increasingly it's being shown more broadly than that, beyond the numbers and picking the right credit card. Uh, we actually did an event today, what we did in association with a mental health health organization in Canada, because around the world it's becoming increasingly recognized that there's a positive correlation between financial health and well-being and physical, general, and mental health and well-being, that probably a lot of your listeners know people who are in stress and anxiety and feeling out of control that help to manifest this self and the mental issues and challenges for people. And so we're trying to get it infused into a whole range of subjects, not just mathematical ones as well, but ones that help to build the holistic child that teaches them the discipline of staying in control, making their own decisions, because there are so many influencers out there today, very sophisticated ones, that will want them to make certain decisions, encourage them to make certain decisions, to buy and spend. And what we really want to do is put our kids in control, let them be their own boss of their money, and learn that to stay away from the situations of stress and anxiety that can bring on other complications in life. You had a money fair today in downtown Toronto uh, Mm -hmm. featuring former Maple Leaf Darcy Tucker. How'd it go? It went very well. We were delighted. We had, uh, in this case, we had a 
two classes of uh, grade five and six students who picked a topic like in they didn't uh, similar in the science sphere of uh, the money topic that is of interest to them. They uh, did research, prepared creative displays, and we assembled those all in a central area, uh, actually at Scotia Plaza downtown with our partner. Darcy Tucker came and spoke about some of his lessons that he had learned about money. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a representative there who spoke about the importance of building good health in this area. What, what, did, Tuck, they, what did Tucker yeah. say, that he spent all his money that he played for in the NHL? <laughs> he, he, he blew about a when lot he first of it? Signed, when he first signed with Montreal, he put... Uh, he bought a truck and he put the rest in an RRSP and he said that uh, later on in later 2000s he took the money that he had had in the RRSP and he helped to rebuild his family's farm and he talked about how he made a commitment to saving built up that saving and as such now that turned the family farm into more twice as productive and profitable as the farm used to be with the investment he made saving that money in that RRSP smarter than I thought <laughs> uh, you got. I mean, I, you, I mean, it was a great lesson for the kids, and something I think a lot of maybe some other hockey players wish they'd done along the way too. Well, that's what I, that, where I thought you were going. I didn't know what Tucker did after he retired, but I, I, and I don't know obviously what he, you know, how he spends his money. But there are many, <laughs> there are many tales of professional athletes who have gone bankrupt, who make tons of money, and they didn't do it as wisely. Uh, so you're uh, in the NBA right now. Team. I think they're providing that kind of counseling to players because of the historic record of so many NBA players going and NFL players going bankrupt uh, within very short periods. You know, of but time. you know what the, their problem is? They're dum dums. It's as simple as that. They're dum dums. <laughs> I think what they do though is they live a lifestyle that they have trouble giving up as they go along, and maybe they well, if you've got a posse them. of nine people and you're letting them live in your house and everybody gets a BMW, and <laughs> if you can't find a, a one person who you can trust as a financial planner to trust, you know, with your money, well, then you're a dum-dum if you're making that kind of money. I'm sorry. I've met some of these professional athletes, and I'm uh, – no excuses. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, that's why I was quite uh, – we're never quite sure what our, our, our guests are going to – say but we were delighted when darcy tucker had such a good lesson to share with the kids yeah that's positive and it's it's surprising not because it's darcy tucker just because usually athletes have tales of woe as opposed to you know positive thing uh gary thank you very much for this uh so uh this will take place again next year i guess uh, in mid-april yeah, it's, it's really all through the year now it's uh, really worked out that way where parents and teachers are using uh, as i said talk with our kids about money.com they're they're all year for teachers and parents are using any day can be a talk with their kids about money day or a financial literacy day. And so we encourage uh, at your will, when you're comfortable, get started because it will pay dividends down the road. Appreciate this, Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Gary Rabior is president of the Canadian Foundation for Economic Education.